Galaxies, they are the ultimate star structures and the titans of the universe. Though observing distant galaxies makes them seem tiny, most are full to the brim with hundreds of billions of stars. The majority of these stars are home to their own planetary systems and they are all anchored together by supermassive engine black holes within. These brilliant ancient tie-dyes of space come in many different shapes and sizes and new estimates suggest that there may be up to 2 trillion galaxies in our observable universe alone. We live in a vast, old, spiral shaped galaxy known as the Milky Way, but many other, much older and vaster galaxies elsewhere in our local supercluster dwarf our own. Each galaxy is massive. But what is the largest galaxy? We can see cascading galaxies extending hundreds of thousands of light years, but how big can they get? Truth be told, we don't know if there is a definite size limit, but one galaxy you can bet comes pretty close is the magnificent IC1101. IC1101 is the largest and most massive galaxy ever to be discovered, and is currently the champion of the observable universe. This enormous elliptical galaxy would completely engulf the Milky Way dozens of times over, and its sheer volume of estimated stars have made for some interesting discussions on the possibility of life beyond the Earth. Something else that catches the eye is the hypothesised metrics of the ultramassive black hole that guides it through space. The largest galaxy in the universe should correspond to the largest black hole, and every aspect of this cosmic beast boasts dimensions we once thought were impossible. The largest galaxy ever discovered sits at a distant 1.04 billion light years from the Earth, in the constellation of Virgo primarily, but it overlaps into other constellations. It is located at the centre of the Abel 2029 galaxy cluster, and is by far the brightest feature within the region, shining with an apparent visual magnitude of 14.73, particularly bright for such a distant galaxy. For some kind of comparison, let's first consider the Milky Way galaxy. Our home galaxy is estimated to be anywhere from between 100 to 120,000 light years in diameter. This size gives it the classification of a mid-range galaxy. IC1101 absolutely smashes this, clocking in a staggering 6 million light years across, approximately 2,000 times more massive than our own galaxy. Though this is a good estimate for its size, we now know that many galaxies extend further than once thought, but the true, invisible extent of the galaxy remains a mystery. What we do know, however, is that IC1101 is over 200 times bigger than our own galaxy, and its expected star tally is in line with this too. This gives it a mind-numbing estimation of up to 100 trillion stars within. When comparing our home with this big galaxy, the Milky Way appears as a small smudge, dwarfed in every single respect. This galaxy is bursting with stars, and as such we predict that it is probably fairly void of things like nebulae and other more abstract astronomical features. We don't have an estimate for the age of this beast, but based on its size and colour we know that it is in the latter stages of its life. The yellow tinge of this galaxy is indicative of metal rich stars, which would suggest that the vast majority of stars within are about 7 to 8 billion years older than our own sun. Our sun is estimated to be about 4.5 billion years old, meaning the seeds that were sown to produce this monster would have originated not too long after the Big Bang and the advent of the first galaxies. A reasonable estimate of the galaxy's age would be about 11 billion years old, with well-defined error bars, but we cannot say this for sure. IC1101's size and sheer numbers of stars have made it a common topic for conversation for speculation of intelligent life prevailing within. Mathematically speaking, this galaxy would have the best chance of supporting life somewhere within its massive expanse given it is the largest. However, we predict that there is a lot of radiation and close contact with neighbouring stars occurring within this galaxy, meaning conditions for life may be slightly less favourable on a star by star comparison to a younger, less massive galaxy. But then again, we cannot conclude on this with any accuracy. If life were to exist within, we do know that, thanks to the sheer number of stars and the radiating light within, the internal regions of this galaxy would be so bright that any prospecting civilizations on the inside may not actually be able to see out of it. Its core is so oversaturated with stars and starlight that this may render the rest of its own arbitrary observable universe invisible. This means that any race would believe IC1101 to be the totality of what they understood to be creation. But given the size of this galaxy, you couldn't blame them for such ignorance. Much like the Andromeda Galaxy, IC1101 was first discovered hundreds of years ago, but was mistaken for a nebula within the bounds of the Milky Way. 
It was first noted in 1790 by German-born British astronomer Frederick William Herschel, but it took another 105 years before it was catalogued. In 1985, an astronomer by the name of John Louis Emil Dreyer recorded it as the 1101st object of the Index Catalogue of Nebulae and Star Clusters, hence coining its name of IC1101. 25 years later, another so-called nebula was causing controversy, Messier 31. Some were starting to speculate that this object may actually be extragalactic. This led to the Great Debate of 1920, where Heber Curtis proposed that Messier 31 may be a separate star structure to the Milky Way. In 1925, Edwin Hubble joined the debate when he identified Cepheid variable stars from images of the object. A further four years passed before he published his findings, when in 1929 he claimed that Messier 31 was an independent galaxy to the Milky Way, and we may reside in a universe of hundreds, thousands, or even millions of these galaxies. This was one of Edwin Hubble's most important discoveries, and three years after, a follow-up analysis concluded that IC1101 was also extragalactic. However, astronomers at the time had no idea of its size. In 1995, the same year that the infamous Hubble Deep Field image was released, we began taking clear images of this galaxy and began to finally get a sense of how big it truly was. Ever since then, it has remained the largest galaxy ever discovered. But the question is, why is it so big? We've observed millions of galaxies of enormous but somewhat consistent sizes among a well-defined range. There are numerous galaxies like ours, so how did this galaxy come to be so much more enormous than the swathes of other galaxies in our observable universe? Well, the answer lies in the nature of galaxy formation and more importantly, galaxy collision. We don't know for certain how galaxies in the universe first formed, but we believe it to be one of two hypotheses. The first is that supermassive gas clouds began collapsing under the weight of their own gravity, creating dense regions that allowed stars to be formed within. It is believed that some of these gas clouds would have been capable of forming the first supermassive black holes. The alternate theory suggests that, shortly after the Big Bang, the universe had clumps of matter which formed galaxies in a similar way. In reality, it's likely a combination of these two theories. Gravity essentially planted the seas that formed the first galaxies. The earliest supermassive black holes acted as anchors and drew the first clusters of stars into orbit around them. These small, premature galaxies were then drawn to each other by gravity, and they collided with each other. This sequence is known as a galaxy merger, and it appears to be commonplace throughout the universe. Presently, neighbouring galaxies are quite close together. Those not flung out of reach by cosmic inflation are attracted to one another, and over billions of years they collide, again and again, forming new, increasingly more illustrious star structures. The first stage of this process begins with dwarf galaxies. These smaller, less structured galaxies formed from early star clusters and are still forming all over the universe. Dwarf galaxies can house up to a few hundred million stars at a time, and tend to only be a few hundred light years across. These dwarf galaxies were the earliest galaxies to begin colliding. When galaxies of this size collide, their black hole cores move towards each other faster than the stars that orbit them. As the two cores circumvent, they create a trail of stars behind them, forming galactic arms. Once the cores collide and the compound galaxy is formed, these arms become spirals, leading us to the next stage of galactic evolution. Spiral galaxies are a lot larger than dwarf galaxies and are a lot more self-sustaining. The dwarf collisions often cause large gas clouds within each galaxy to merge within the spiral, which makes them much more productive, creating thousands and even millions of new stars. These new stars drive the total star count up and are young, early stars, typically giving spiral galaxies a blue tinge, much like our nearest galactic neighbour. Spiral galaxies range in size, from billions of stars to upwards of one trillion. Our Milky Way is believed to be a spiral galaxy due to the apparent presence of galactic arms and as such we are classified as an intermediate sized spiral galaxy. Spiral galaxies are drawn together much like dwarf galaxies, as is the case with the Milky Way and Andromeda right now. When these collide, large areas of gas clouds glow with the birth of new stars. Eventually, the cores are merged into an extremely bright centre and the third stage compound galaxy becomes much larger. If the collision causes there to be disproportionately more stars occupying a comparatively small area, these galaxies are referred to as starburst galaxies. These starburst galaxies eventually lead us to the final stage. Once spiral galaxies exceed a certain size, they become so massive and dense that the arms are lost. These galaxies are then classified as giant elliptical galaxies, and are believed to be the final stage before the galaxy starts to die. 
Elliptical galaxies are much older than other types and at this point the clouds within stop producing millions of new stars and the existing stars move into the latter stages of their lives, giving them a slightly whiter or yellowish colour. IC 1101 is a star bursting giant elliptical galaxy and must have continued to collide over billions of years since the very earliest days of the universe, but it is reaching the end of this life cycle and its days are increasingly numbered. The theory of merging galaxies is evidenced by the presence of the largest galaxies at the centre of galaxy clusters, much like IC 1101. The Virgo cluster and Coma cluster also both have multiple giant elliptical galaxies at their centres. Eventually, the compound galaxy we will join into, Milkdromeda, will sear the heart of the local group. But, as mentioned before, the giant elliptical phase is the final stage, prompting a galaxy to enter the twilight of its life. IC 1101 is classed as a dying galaxy, with its star numbers declining. Constant collisions eventually cause the gas clouds in starburst galaxies to thin out, and while pockets of a few thousand stars may still spring up throughout IC 1101's expanse, stars are dying and being eaten by the black hole at a much faster pace. The yellow tinge is a big indication of this, given the suspected age of the stars within. When galaxies collide, the space between stars is usually so vast that the majority of stars in each galaxy remain unscathed. As such, the same stars can be present in a giant elliptical galaxy that began life in a dwarf galaxy billions of years before. These supermassive galaxies do not die in spectacular cataclysms like stars do, instead they simply fade away when viewed from a wide enough angle. Were we to survive billions of years into the future, we would see this once almighty god of the cosmos simply recede and eventually fade from view like a ghost. It's a chilling reminder that even the biggest things that seem unstoppable eventually come to an end. Given the estimated size and structure of IC1101, we predict it to have an ultra-massive engine black hole binding it together. While we cannot observe it given the visual distortion, the galaxy's core is radio loud and bright, suggesting a massive black hole and an accretion disk. IC1101's black hole's size has been speculated on over the years. Given it anchors the largest known galaxy together, most jump to the conclusion that it must be the largest black hole ever discovered. However, we aren't entirely sure that this is the case. Of course, the actual size is unknown. There's simply too much distortion and too many variables to directly measure its metrics. But based upon the galaxy's size, the black hole could be anywhere from 40 billion to 100 billion times the mass of our sun. The disparity between the upper and lower bounds has caused IC1101's black hole to be placed at second on the list of the largest black holes ever discovered, with first place going to a very distant and extremely radio loud and luminous quasar named TON618. We can conclude on TON's mass more precisely than IC1101's black hole's mass, and this has been measured to be approximately 66 billion solar masses given the reach that it has across space. This gives it the number one spot, as we cannot say for certain that IC1101's supermassive black hole isn't at the lower bound of the estimate, closer to 40 billion solar masses. Certain hypotheses put forward in recent years propose a size limit for black holes, claiming that they should not be able to exceed 50 billion solar masses, due to the fact that they would start to lose their accretion disks. Therefore, it may be very difficult to compare and contrast TON618 and IC1101 in the face of all these theories, anomalies and unanswered questions. In any case, whether it is the biggest or second biggest black hole, IC1101's black hole is still an absolute monster, which will continue to devour its surroundings in massive gulps as its stellar family dies around it. Certain surveys estimate the comparative size of our observable universe to be a minimal 0.25% of the totality of the entire unobservable universe. While we can never conclusively say what lies beyond the cosmic horizon, IC1101 being referred to as the largest galaxy in the universe in a sample size this small may be leaping to conclusions somewhat. However, if a galaxy of IC1101's size is observable within a survey area of the total universe that is this small, then imagine what else may be lurking out there beyond our field of view. We don't really know if there's a theoretical size limit for galaxies, but it may depend on the size limit for ultramassive black holes. However, it's safe to assume IC1101 is on the upper bound, but it could be one of hundreds, thousands or even millions of giant ellipticals of its size. In the future, we will try and learn more about this galaxy, but it's unlikely that we will ever have the capacity to see inside it. But with rapid improvements in technology, who knows? 
It's safe to assume we will begin to learn more about this galaxy as our knowledge of the universe increases, even if we cannot see within. Just imagine what secrets could be concealed within this godfather of creation.